Good afternoon, I'm Mark Allen with Gaber.io and I'm here today with Jen Savada, the Chief Future Officer of Mission Tech in Arlington, Virginia. Good afternoon, Jen, how you doing? Hi, good afternoon, Mark. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great today. That's great. And, and I have to ask you, uh, Chief Future Officer, can you explain that to our audience, please? Sure. So a Chief Futures Officer is sort of a combination between a Chief Strategy Officer and a Chief Innovation Officer, where we're trying to build the best technology, business practices, and other components of innovation towards the future with an eye towards the future. And it's harnessing the technology, the capabilities, and really trying to figure out what the problems are that need to be solved. Very interesting. And, and you ever introduce yourself as the CFO and people get a little confused? <laughs> you know, I don't usually say the whole thing because I am not a finance person and I do not want anybody to think that I am. Yes. Okay. So, so can you share a brief background on yourself, of yourself and your work experience before you became a C Chief Futures Officer? <laughs> sure. I um, recently, actually almost a year ago now, retired after almost 26 years in the Air Force. And my time in the Air Force, I spent as an intelligence officer, but during that time, most of my experience was were related to bringing on future technologies and capabilities into government. And whether it was helping to modernize aircraft, whether it was bringing in new data analytics systems, helping with artificial intelligence, or even trying to make sure that our talent is the most um, digitally focused and understood that we could have. Well, interesting, and were you, stationed in the DC area or were you stationed in Colorado Springs? I was stationed all over the world. I oh. spent some time in Colorado Springs. I did go to the Air Force Academy, which is located in Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. um, but the last, I guess the last nine of the last 10 years I spent in the DC area, really focusing on more strategic level um, intelligence related issues and technology issues. Wow, that's really uh, very interesting stuff. So what has been your experience with remote employment in all these years? So interestingly enough, the last three years that I spent in the military, I worked remotely quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I know that may sound odd, but um, for the last year I did talent management. So trying to bring um, the 35,000 people across the Air Force Intelligence Enterprise together and trying to figure out how to advance the talent that we did have, bring them into the digital age, make sure that we upscale our workforce and also appreciate them for what they do. That work could be done from anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I was to work from home i was able to work in the office depending on what needed to be done and the two years before that i was a liaison between the private sector and the government where i helped to integrate information technology um, as well as different points of view between think tanks universities nonprofits, and small to medium businesses and so that required me to be able to be more remote and work from home and um, be able to to do things that you couldn't normally do within the government space like video calls that was something that was so um, far from reality just really? three years ago, because many of the spaces that the government has are classified spaces. So you can't have a video call in a classified space. Oh, okay. And so you have to be someplace where you could, and yeah. that enabled remote work. Yeah, very interesting. And, and since you worked for the Air Force, did you ever get to get a ride in any of those uh, airplanes? I did I went in several of them. Um, did F-15 rides, F-16 rides, and then a lot of the big heavy planes, the C-130s, C-5s. That's how they transport a lot of us around when we deploy to remote locations. Oh, very interesting. And a little side note, my dad was in the Air Force, so I'm very fond of the uh, of that branch of, of the military. <laughs> so what do you think is the future of remote employment? Uh, and what do you think can be done differently to make it more effective? Yeah, so interestingly enough, um, the company that I'm with now, which uh, is Mission Tech Solutions, we are a national security company. So we support a lot of the classified clients within the national security space. And with that comes having to work on site or the perception that you have to work on site. Mm -hmm. When COVID happened, we were all pushed off site. Um, but we were lucky enough that a lot of the things that we were doing, whether it was software development or um, creating different um, enterprise tools for our client, we could do a lot of that in the unclassified world. We could do it in the remote space. We could do it at home. We could do it on our own computers because what the difference is, is that technically or traditionally the data is what's classified, not the tools that you're using in order to process that data or analyze that data. And what it did is that it really changed the, the mindset of our client to say, you know what, there is some flexibility in how we bring people into our space. We have the flexibility now and, and actually sometimes increase productivity by allowing people to work in a more open environment 
where you have open source tools that you can use. You, can, you have access to GitHub now. You have access to other things that might not have been as easily accessible from a government network. Interesting. And when you say GitHub, I mean, that's just such a standard of the IT industry. It's hard to believe that that took this, you know, a pandemic to make that um, available. And, and I'm assuming at home you have to, you do have to have extra security on your local or your your computer, correct? Of course. I mean, we still have VPNs that we we tunnel in through in order to keep our own network safe. But I think any corporation, any company, tries to make sure that their own data is secure, that they've got cybersecurity mm -hmm. practices in place, they've got VPNs in place. They also are trying to look out for all those people that are spamming us on email on a regular basis. Yes, and, you know, it's never ending. Doesn't matter if it's home or if it's at work. Yeah. I do understand. Yes. So what is the story behind Mission Tech Solutions? Um, you got into it a little bit what you guys do, but you know, who is your real end customer and and how did it start? And how did you become a member of them? Sure. So Mission Tech Solutions was started by two gentlemen, Jeff Smergolino and Matt Scott. And it was about um a year and a half ago now is when the company mm -hmm. started. The two of them were working for larger corporations. Um, one was in a consulting firm. One was the COO of a, a cloud um, development company. And they decided one day to try to break the filter of working in these big conglomerates that come in and oftentimes do a very good job, but they're just such an unwieldy mechanism that it's sometimes hard to make rapid change and be able to impact the mission as quickly. So they formed their own company and it started off as a two person contract. Very soon thereafter, um, the client said, hey, we need you to scale to about 30 people. So we scaled from two to 30 people in the span of six weeks. And these wow. were all highly technical personnel from uh, cloud architects, software engineers, uh, systems integrators, you, know, you name it, uh, systems engineers, um, to try to help our clients solve some of their most challenging problems. The client that we do work with or the clients that we work with are within the national security arena, primarily the intelligence community. So we are trying to tackle some of the most challenging and difficult problems because we're not only dealing with them in an unclassified environment, but we're also dealing with them in these highly classified environments. And based on the work that we are doing to bring one, first to help discover what their most pressing challenges are, because a lot of times we, we think that we know what our problem is, hmm. but when people start asking questions, you realize that that might only be a symptom of the problem and is not the actual problem. So we help our clients get to the, the root of the problem or what they think is the problem. And then we use a process that we call the Promethean process, which goes through the, the evolution of determining what kind of solutions we need to develop, whether it's a business process, change management, if it's a technical solution, helping them uncover what that technology may be determining if it exists in the commercial sector, because we'd prefer to use commercial technology over something that needs to be developed within government. And if there isn't something commercially available or it needs to be modified, we will help them with that solution development and then integrate it into the, the systems that they have. Wow, and so, I mean, 30 people in six weeks, just the logistics of that alone, and are they all from the DC area or are they all over the country? We have brought people in from all over. So we are mainly focused in DC but we have hired people from across the US. Uh, and so it's a matter of, hey, we'll move you here. Let's get here. Let's let's start supporting the client in doing the mission. Um, people have been excited to join us. I joined, I was employee number 11, um, mm. joined about a year ago, almost to the day and have loved it ever since. And we have continued to grow, believe it or not, we are now at 30 W2 employees and another 30 to 40 that are subcontracting to us. So in the span of a little over a year, we are now at a 60, 70 person contract. Wow, that, I mean, that is really unbelievable growth. I mean, we see that here in Silicon Valley, uh, but it, it's just like, wow. And, and, and I know, that, I mean, that is quite a challenge. <laughs> Interesting. So the ongoing pandemic forced everybody to go remote. Um, it sounds like you actually, do you have an office in DC, in the DC area? Does your we company? A co-working space that has four desks in it. Everybody else works remotely from home or, and I will have to say that our client has started calling, recalling people back, back to work. Um, so we have people that are on shift schedules where they'll go in for a week and then they'll be home for a week to try to continue some of the classified work that needs to get done. Hmm, interesting. So did, did, um, and has that been since day one or is that since COVID? Um, that's been since COVID. Okay. There's 
was going to change. It used to be everybody went to work every day. You pulled into the parking lot, you badged in, mm. you, you might see some daylight if you went out and uh, went to lunch. If not, you will show up, you know, as the sun is setting, you'll badge out and get in your car and go home. Wow. So did, did the ongoing pandemic cause any unusual challenges for you just by the nature of the work you do? I mean, it's very classified. Did that cause any challenges like when it first hit? Surprisingly enough for us, it didn't. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons why is that the two owners of Mission Tech were very, um, they, they looked to the future and had in our contract our ability to work remotely. And huh. there are a lot of government contractors that hadn't thought about that previously. So when COVID hit, and there was no relief from the government, it was a do or die situation where people who couldn't go on site weren't getting paid. Hmm. That was actually a boon for us because we were able to lure and hire some of those really highly qualified people to come work for us during COVID. I think we ended up hiring six or seven people since COVID has started because we have the flexibility to work remotely. We didn't lose any um, billable hours or time um, with our clients and we continue to grow. So looking at that, I think people saw our culture and the way that we worked as something that they wanted to come join. Wow, and, and you still have more, even more open recs right now? We do. Um, we're still looking for, for cleared software developers and um, a couple DevSecOps people and even some security folks. Wow, interesting. I've had a couple of uh, calls with security people. Maybe I'll send you some resumes. I actually did one this week, a really smart guy in security, as a matter of fact. So um, interesting. So there's companies like Gaper that help develop, build, and scale products. Now, you are a very unique company. I mean, you know, we have developers in the U.S. and we have developers abroad. I mean, can a company like yours use develop, offshore developers or does it all have to be U.S.-based? For us, it has to be U.S.-based. That's based on our contracts. When you work with the U.S. government, they've got a requirement. Just like everything's got to be made in the U.S., everybody's got to be at least a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the constraints that we do have that can limit our ability to find talent. Because as we know, there are so many qualified people that don't live in the United States that are looking for work and can work remotely. Yes, I agree. But as, as a U.S. citizen, I'm also glad that that is in effect, to be honest with you. <laughs> Well, Jen, I know it's late there. I know it's uh, it's the weekend where you are. So uh, I want to wish you a great weekend. I want to thank you for your time today. This has been very interesting. And like I said, have a great weekend. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate your time. All right. Bye.